and I will be covering the basic information about Bandura's study on aggression. This is the first study in the learning chapter in your A-level syllabus for the AS module. Uh, learning never stops. I always tell my students, you know, learning is a good thing. Learning is important, even though it can seem quite tiresome when you're learning for exams. But even the great Albert Einstein said, once you stop learning, you start dying, right? So always have that, you know, that sense of natural curiosity that children have. Everybody has this as a child, right? They're very curious about the world, but some, somewhere along the lines, it kind of dies after high school and then everybody just learns for the sake of exams. Uh, but try not to do that, you know, try to keep that curiosity alive and learning becomes a lot more enjoyable. So this is our first study of learning. We're going to look at Bandura's study. Uh, incidentally, Bandura's other two authors are uh, Ross and Ross, right? Uh, their last name is my first name. Anyway, the study is about aggression, right? Well, particularly on imitative learning, right? Imitative learning of aggression. Um, before I start my class, you know, since we're in the uh, pandemic times, uh, I usually ask my students a quick survey online. I use Mentimeter, it's really nice. And I ask them how they release their anger or aggression, right? What they do to release. And um, most of them put cry, which is why cry is the biggest word there. Uh, some people listen to music, watch Harry Potter, hold it in and cry afterwards, squeeze a plush toy, rant to friends, sleep, keep it in, you know, watch YouTube, lots of different things um, that we do when we're faced with anger, right? How do we release our anger? Um, is it an aggressive way? Is it a non-aggressive way, right? So uh, that's just to get my students interested in the topic, right? Now, let's do a little bit of background about uh, Bandura's study. Uh, this is an important word. It's called catharsis, right? Catharsis. And uh, previously, we believed that catharsis was the process of venting aggression as a way to release or get rid of emotions, right? It's a kind of like a purging process, right? Um, it's the way people get rid of their feelings of aggression, right? Especially by uh, what was believed when we watch other people do an aggressive behavior, that's when we reduce aggression in ourselves, right? Just watching someone else do it, like watching a boxing match, right? There's a lot of aggression in the boxing ring that somehow reduces aggression in the viewer, right? Well, that's what people used to believe. Um, current research kind of shows us that this doesn't really hold up, right, to the evidence. So, uh, there were some therapies like Freud's catharsis therapy where he applied this knowledge. Um, if I remember correctly, what the therapy involves is uh, taking someone who has uh, gone through a traumatic experience in their life and then asking them to recollect and sort of like reimagine themselves in that traumatic experience. And that kind of helps them process through it, right? Sometimes that happens with trauma. We experience a trauma, but we don't process through it correctly. And because of that, we have a lot of negative consequences, right? So Freud's therapy was based on this idea, like watching it or going through that experience uh, vicariously seems to help us uh, reduce uh, those negative feelings of aggression in ourselves. All right. Uh, so this was a study by these three authors. Um, they found that people who punched bags were actually more aggressive, right? So according to the catharsis theory, uh, we should be able to reduce, uh, excuse me, not the catharsis theory, but um, this was a different, uh, different concept entirely where people believed uh, punching a bag would uh, help reduce aggression, but they actually found the opposite results. It actually made people more aggressive, right? Uh, so there are three major types of behavioral learning, right, um, in psychology. The first one is classical conditioning. A classic, yeah, it's where a neutral stimulus is associated with a natural response. Uh, operant conditioning, uh, response is increased or decreased due to reinforcement and punishment. And observational learning, learning occurs through observation and imitation of others, right? So that's why I'm going to be covering observational learning in more detail, but I'll touch briefly on the first two as well. I just want to say thank you to VeryWellMind.com, right? They're an amazing resource for psychology studies, and they've got these wonderful, uh, really beautiful um, images, right? So I, I'm just uh, using this image um, under fair use for educational purposes, uh, but, you know, I really want to say thank you to very, very well Mind for these um, pictures. They're very nice. Okay, classical conditioning. Uh, Ivan Pavlov, a very key researcher in this area, he paired a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned natural response, right? So he did this um, with dogs. At right? the sound of the buzzer, the dog begins to salivate, right? So a lot of people think it's actually a bell. Actually, uh, Ivan Pavlov never used a bell, right? That was, if I remember correctly, it's a mistranslation of a Russian word. It was actually a buzzer, and he tested it on dogs. I'll show you what I mean with this uh, picture, right? So the dog 
naturally salivates when it sees food. Right? Dogs love to eat food and the saliva starts dripping. Um, that's a natural response, unconditional natural response. Now, what he wanted to do is want to teach a dog to salivate on command by pressing a buzzer every time the food comes up. So he presses the buzzer, bzz, bzz, brings out the food. Presses the buzzer, brings out the food. Presses the buzzer, brings out the food. And then pressing the buzzer, but without the food, the dog begins to salivate because it learns that the buzzer means the food is coming, right? So the dog learns. It's called classical conditioning. All right, another example is by John B. Watson. Uh, he did what is known as the Little Albert Experiment, right? Where he made a little baby learn to fear a rat, right? So you can find videos of this online. That's little baby Albert. And if you can see that down there, that's little white color rat placed in front of him by the experimenter. Now, initially, when the baby saw the rat, it wasn't afraid, right? Babies are not usually naturally afraid of small things um, at that age. And um, what, what the experimenter later did was that every time they introduced the rat, uh, he would um, bang on a piece of metal, if I'm not mistaken, with a hammer and make a loud bang sound. And so babies are naturally afraid of loud sounds, right? They, they react by crying when they hear loud sounds. So, uh, see the rat bang, see the rat bang, see the rat bang. And then every time the bang came on, even if there was no rat, uh, sorry, if, uh, sorry, every time the rat was introduced, even if there was no bang sound, the baby had learned to fear the rat because it thinks that the bang sound is going to happen and so would start crying, right? Uh, rather an ethical experiment, but, you know, uh, that's classical conditioning. You can find more videos online. We won't go through that. Uh, let's go to operant conditioning. B.F. Skinner, one of the pioneer researchers, he experimented on rats. He got rats to push a lever to get food or jump to avoid shocks. Uh, this whole thing about operant conditioning is uh, centered around reinforcement and punishment. Another word for reinforcement is reward, right? Giving rewards like food or punishing uh, the rats by giving electric shocks. Okay, it can be positive or negative. Positive means to add something and negative means to take something away, right? Uh, show you with a picture. So it looks something like that, right? That's just an illustration. So can you see the rat is actually pushing a lever? Now the rat doesn't actually know initially when it's put into the box that pressing the lever is going to do anything. Uh, but every time it presses the lever, usually the first or second time is by accident, uh, food is released. So press the lever, food comes out, oh, I get a reward. Okay, press the lever again, food comes out, reward. Okay, so I'm learning that every time I press the lever, I get a reward. So the rat learns to press the lever. That's operant conditioning, right? Now, we're going to be looking a bit more into detail uh, for observational learning, where behaviors learn through watching and replicating others. Another beautiful image by verywellmind.com. Um, what they have is uh, this first picture, right? These uh, two people are trying to learn how to eat chopsticks. Looks like they're in a Chinese restaurant. Uh, they don't look like they know what they're supposed to do with it, right? And then they look around. Right? So look around, look at the neighbors, look at the other customers, and like, oh, okay, so like they're holding it a certain way. All right, so then they figure out, okay, so this is how we use chopsticks, okay? Uh, I, I, I am not very good at using chopsticks. I can honestly say that even though I watch someone else doing it properly, uh, it's not that easy to do. It still takes a bit of practice. Um, but this picture illustrates the concept of observational learning, right? Uh, so the theory behind it is called the social learning theory, right? Behavior is learned through a process of observation, right? So there are four stages, attention, if you remember from the previous picture, the attention that they're giving is by watching the other customers. Okay, they, they have to watch the behavior. If there's no attention, you won't know what behavior to copy, right? Next is retention. Retention is the ability to remember what to do, right? So the two people are watching other customers and they remember, they're like, okay, so um, they're using their hands in a certain way, they're holding in a certain way. You have to have that capacity of memory in order to uh, do the third stage which is the reproduction, right? Nothing to do with making a baby. This has everything to do with reproducing the behavior. So in the previous picture, uh, the two uh, people were trying to uh, reproduce the behavior of using chopsticks that they had seen and they had remembered about how to hold the pair of chopsticks in their hand. Last but not the least is motivation, right? Motivation is basically getting a reward or um, when you do the behavior that makes you want to do the behavior more, right? Or perhaps a punishment that you want to avoid. In the example of the chopsticks, um, the reward would probably be that they get to enjoy their food, right? And so that's a reward and it teaches them that, you know, using the chopsticks in the right way gets me the food uh, into my mouth and that's tasty, so I want to keep on doing that behavior, right? So let's, let's look at some past studies uh, mentioned in the Journal. So there's a previous study by Bandura and Huston, 1961, where children imitated adult models, but this was done in the presence of the model, right? So that's important, right? Another study was by Blake, 
uh, Blake found that observing the responses of a model can facilitate subjects' reaction in a social setting. So, you know, when you're in a social setting and um, the way people react in a certain way can influence your behavior as well, right? So, um, if they give you a, a approving nod, right, that makes you want to do the behavior more, or perhaps a disapproving um, shake of the head and that may stop you from doing the behavior, right? So, we learn like that. Uh, children also perceive parents' preferences for sex-appropriate behavior, right? Um, this, even from a young age, and we'll look at that in Bandura study as well, children are able to um, show that they have preferences on sex-appropriate behavior uh, because their parents um, have a preference, right? So if you see your son uh, playing with a doll, usually parents would say, no, those dolls are for girls, right? Boys should play with trucks and fire engines and stuff like that. And so... Uh, children are able to perceive that parents have that preference um, for what is appropriate for boys and what's appropriate for girls, right? That was by Falls and Smith, 1956. So let's look at Bandura as well. Bandura, 1965, he also um, talked about vicarious reinforce reinforcement. Excuse me. So um, this is uh, in the experiment that he ran. The model's aggression was being rewarded, right? The model was given some sweets and a drink for what was known as a championship performance. Yeah, well done, you hit something and you got a, uh, you did a good job, right? So I give you a reward. And um, in another condition, the model was punished, right? For their aggression, they got scolded. And in the control condition, I believe, there were no specific consequences, right? That was the control condition. Now, children were watching the model in all these three circumstances, in all these three conditions, right? In one condition, they're rewarded. In one condition, they're punished. And in the third condition, uh, the control condition, nothing happens, no specific consequences. Now, children are watching them, but children, the children themselves don't receive a reward or punishment. That's why it's a vicarious. They're sort of like experiencing it through someone else. That's the word vicarious. That's what it means. The reinforcement refers to the reward and the punishment. Now, which group do you think repeated the aggressive behaviors more? Well, it was the first group, right? The group that got rewarded for their aggression, right? So if a child watches a model getting rewarded for being aggressive, they're more likely to repeat aggressive behaviors more as well, right? Now, so what are the research gaps or the questions that Bandura kind of had, right? So what if the model is not present? So earlier on, we looked at examples from past studies where the model was present in the room and the children imitated their behavior, right? So we know that's true. Uh, what if we take out the model from the room? Would the child still perform those behaviors, right? Also, are there any gender differences, right, between boys and girls when it comes to this imitation of aggression? Now, you can probably find a lot of different videos online on the Bobo doll experiment. That's uh, one word, uh, sorry, one phrase that is often used to describe Bandura study because you use the Bobo doll. I just took a screenshot from a video online. I can't show you the actual video because every time I do, uh, YouTube takes down my video for copyright infringement. Sorry. Uh, but anyway, this is just a picture where you can see the model there is uh, about to hammer a mallet into the bobo doll's face, right? So the bobo doll is a doll that's uh, you can knock it down and it just comes back up again, right? Can't show you that video, you can find it for yourself online. Now, there were four hypotheses that were put forward by Bandura. It's a bit hard to read the hypotheses exactly from the journal, so what I usually do is I refer to the Cambridge textbook um, so for psychology, it's a lot easier there, right? Hypothesis number one, observed aggressive behavior will be imitated so children seeing aggressive models will be more aggressive than those seeing a non-aggressive model or no model, right? So there are basically three conditions and then one is the aggressive condition and Bandura believes that children who watch uh, models perform in the aggressive condition will show the highest amount of aggressive behaviors, right? Compared to the other two conditions. Next hypothesis. Observed non-aggressive behavior will be imitated, so children seeing non-aggressive models will be less aggressive than those seeing no model, right? So now he's comparing the non-aggressive group to the control condition where they don't see a model, right? And he's saying that those who see a non-aggressive model will be less aggressive than those in the control condition, right? Hypothesis number three. What does hypothesis three say? Children are more likely to copy a same-sex model. So boys are more likely to copy the male model. Girls are more likely to copy the female model. Right? Last but not the least, hypothesis four. Boys will be more likely to copy aggression than girls. Right? So he specifically hypothesized that the boys will probably show a bit more aggressive behavior than the girls. Does it sound sexist? Well, this is research. We've got to find out whether it's true. Right? Research design was a laboratory experiment. 
Okay, we'll look at that in a bit more detail. Uh, it was in an artificial setting, right? It wasn't in their homes. It was in a, a rooms that were set up specifically on the uh, grounds of the university. Right? Uh, what type of design was it, right? So uh, you've got to read your own study, check out the textbook as well. Uh, what type of design? It was an independent measures design primarily because all the students, or rather all the subjects, uh, only went through one level of the IV. Uh, but if you want to be more specific, it was actually also a repeated measures design to a certain extent. Uh, we'll talk about that in a, a few more slides to go. Let's look at the IV, right? There are three IVs. First one is model type or aggression condition. Now, there's the aggressive condition where the model performs aggressive behaviors. The non-aggressive condition where the model uh, just plays uh, quietly in the corner with some toys. And the control condition where there's no model present in the room at all. Now, the second IV is the model gender, right? We also want to look at their genders. We have a male model, one male model, and one female model, right? Finally, the learner gender, or the gender of the subjects, right? Could be either boy or girl. Now, you could use male and female as well. However, I like to differentiate it with boy and girl when I'm referring to the subjects uh, rather than male and female because I'm already calling the models male and female. And if I repeat male and female again, it gets a bit confusing, right? So I usually, when I say boy and girl, I'm referring to the subjects. And when I say male and female, I'm referring to the models who are performing the behaviors, right? Aggressive behaviors. The DV, right? So what are they measuring? They're trying to measure imitative learning, right? Basically, the aggressive behaviors which are shown by the kids, right? They measured these at five second intervals over a period of 20 minutes, right? 20 minute observation every five seconds, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, I know that's not exactly five seconds accurately, but after every five seconds, uh, they look at what the children are doing and they note down the frequency of their behavior. Right? So this is what the room setup looks like. Uh, the boy is holding a mallet, it's the bobo doll, and you know, very threateningly pointing at the bobo doll, hitting the bobo doll. So every five seconds, they would look at what the child was doing and note down the child's behavior, right? Now, uh, there were different kinds of behaviors that they categorized. Uh, firstly was imitative aggression, right? These are the behaviors that were imitated exactly from the model. So what did the model do? The model had some kinds of, of physical aggression where they hit the bobo doll with a mallet, they laid the doll down on the side, sat on the doll and punched it in the face. Or they even tossed it in the air. I shouldn't say or. And they tossed it in the air. So in the aggression condition, the male and the female model performed all these three behaviors. Hitting it, putting it down, punching it in the face and also tossing it in the air. Right? They also had some forms of verbal aggression. Right? Sock him, hit him down, kick him, throw him in the air, pow. Right? Those were some examples of the uh, verbal aggression words that they, they say, right, out loud. So the children can see the physical aggression, they can hear the verbal aggression. They also had a non-aggressive verbal uh, example, which uh, was, he keeps coming back for more. He sure is a tough fella, right? So those are non-aggressive uh, verbal words, or verbal sentences that were said by the model during the condition, right? Now, those, if, if a child had copied those behaviors uh, directly, those were imitative. Right? But there were cases where the child also copied behaviors, but they didn't copy them perfectly, they copied them partially. Right? So these are partially imitative aggression behaviors. Right? For example, uh, Balura called it mallet aggression, whereby they were striking other objects aggressively with the mallet. You see, in the experimental condition, the models only used the mallet on one toy, which was the bobo doll. Right? They only hit the bobo doll with the mallet. Now, the kids, when they watched this, some of them repeated that perfectly. They took the mallet, hit the bobo doll, but some of them started hitting other objects, right? And so when you hit another object, that's not really a perfect imitation of the behavior that was seen. So that's why it's called partially imitative. And in this case, uh, mallet aggression, right? So using the mallet aggressively uh, against other toys or objects in the room. There was also a case where they sat on the bobo doll, uh, but they didn't attack it, right? So they laid the bobo doll on the side, they sat on it, but they didn't punch it, right? So it's almost um, a full imitation, but because they didn't punch it, we call it partially imitative aggression, right? Now, what about aggression which was non-imitative? Now, I should point out here, non-imitative simply means that the aggressive behavior that was shown by the kids was novel, it was something new, something that they had not seen the models do. It was still aggressive, right? So some examples was um, punching the bobo doll, but not using the mallet. 
so they might use other objects or they might use their fist right remember the models always use the mallet when hitting the dog as it's upright right or uh, all the children were physically aggressive um, towards other objects in the room right um, also the children said some um, verbal response uh, verbal aggressive statements such as cut him stupid ball horses fighting biting knock over people these were not examples that were given by the model Right, the model said other other words like pow, hit him down, right? And so the children were aggressive, but they had novel uh, sentences, right? That's why we call it non-imitative, but still aggression. Let's look at the DV, right? Imitative learning, aggressive behaviors. Again, five second interval. Oh, sorry, I just repeated myself there. I want to talk about the inter-rater reliability, right? So there were two observers who were observing the children's behavior behind a one-way mirror. Right? It was one male model, which was the male model as he was acting in the experiment. And um, he rated all 72 of the kids. Uh, plus, there was also a second observer. Right? That's why you get the inter-rated reliability. They compared the um, measures that they have of the children's behavior and found them to be extremely reliable. Right? 0.9 is very high level of reliability. A question that I often ask my students is, uh, why five-second intervals? Right? And uh, this, this I, don't, I doubt A-levels will ask you this question. It's more like a common sense. I like to get my students to think, right? So why did they measure the behavior in five-second intervals? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Right? Well, think about it from a perspective of common sense, right? If you try to measure a behavior every single second that it was taking place, um, you, you wouldn't have enough speed in your fingers to write down all the behaviors that are happening, right? It wouldn't make sense. So that's why I think they chose a five-second interval because you've got time to look and then take down the notes, okay, in about five seconds, and then you look again and then take down some notes what the children are doing, right? Can't be too quick and it also can't be too long because then you might miss out some of the behaviors if the interval is too long, right? Or you may not be able to record enough behaviors if the interval is too short, right? So I think five seconds is a nice sweet spot. Let's look at the sample, 36 girls, 36 boys, nice equally balanced. All of them were from Stanford University Nursery School, same place, ages around three to six years, okay? Uh, this was so I said earlier the design right you can be a bit more specific by calling it a matched pairs design however there's a little caveat I'm going to make so one experimenter and one nursery school teacher rated 51 children uh, before the experiment even started right they wanted to uh, match their levels of aggression right to remove that as a possible confounding variable they had an inter-rated reliability that was very high as well 0.89 very high now they used four scales on a five point rating system right physical aggression, verbal aggression, aggression towards inanimate objects, and aggression inhibition, right? So again, these are the experimenter and the nursery school teacher watching the kids in their, probably their classroom, or maybe it was a playground, uh, wherever they were watching. I can't exactly remember where it was, um, but essentially they observed the kids and they rated their aggression, right? This was to find out what their pre-existing levels of aggression were, right? Because if, you know, um, if, some of the kids are naturally more aggressive than others. We can't put them all in the same condition. We want to make sure that they are equally distributed, and that's why we use the matched pairs design, right? However, a little caveat here, as I mentioned, um, they only rated 51 children. So what about the other 21 kids? Um, unfortunately, Bandura's study does not specify what happened to them. So were they rated? Were they not? I'm not sure, right? So there's a little caveat here. If you do use the match pairs design, um, if you can find evidence that shows what happened to the other 21 kids, do let me know in the comment section below. Um, as far as I could read in the journal, I couldn't find any evidence uh, for what happened to the remainder of the kids who were not rated. Right? Now, let's look at how they divided them. So 36 girls, 36 boys. Firstly, the aggression condition. 24 children were observing an adult being aggressive with the bobo doll, right? Both physically and verbally. Uh, so six boys with the male model, six boys and the female model, six girls with the male, six girls with the female, right? So everything is beautifully and very nicely uh, distributed, right? There's one of the very few studies where you get this beautiful equal distribution of genders again uh, across the conditions and stuff like that. Now, the second one was the non-aggression condition. 24 children again, now observing an adult just playing um, with toys and ignoring the bobo doll. So I, I should clarify here, they were not playing with the bobo doll. They were playing with a set of, if I remember correctly, Tinker toys um, in the corner and they ignored the bobo doll. They never interacted with it at all. So the same kind of division here for the boys and the girls, male and female model, right? 
It's easy to memorize this if you try it on your own on your notes, and uh, then it's easy to remember. Um, last but not the least was the control condition, so 24 children, but there's no model in the room. Because there's no model in the room, there's no need for me to subdivide the children into four quadrants, right? Now remember what I said earlier before this slide, they were matched for their levels of aggression, right? So if there's, um, let's say, in the 51 children that were rated, um, you found that three of them have high levels of aggression. So you'd put uh, kid, num kid one in the first condition, kid two in the second condition, and kid three in the control condition. Why? You want to make sure that the aggression is um, distributed evenly. Because if all those three kids had high aggression and they fall into the aggression condition, that would make their results uh, very biased, right? Or they fell into the control condition or the non-aggression condition, um, by chance that would make the results also very biased, right? So um, that's why they had to use a matched pairs design. Now, why can't the non-aggression condition be the control group? One of my students asked me this question, right? We've got three conditions, aggression, non-aggression, and control. And, and I can see why students can sometimes get confused, right? Um, you know, they always say, uh, Mr. Ross, if, the, if there's no aggression happening in the non-aggression group, shouldn't that also be called the control condition? But here's the thing, right? In the hypothesis, um, Bandura is also hypothesizing that the non-aggression um, shown by the adult model is going to have an effect on the children's imitative learning, right? And because of that, it's not really a control condition because control condition, uh, uh, excuse me, a control condition should be the absence of the IV entirely. And if I'm hypothesizing that non-aggression has an effect, then that's part of the IV, right? So that's why non-aggression can't be the control. Control is where there are no adults in the room. All right, so you can find a video of Bandura's Bogodol experiment um, online on YouTube and see uh, how it was performed with Bandura himself giving some commentary. I can't show the video, but oops, I can't show the video because copyright issues. Um, let's look at the procedure. So there were three rooms, room one, room two, room three. Uh, for the sake of making things easier in my class, I usually give them the title experimental room, aggression arousal room, and observation room. Although sometimes um, Bandura study uh, refers to the third room as an experimental room as well, I think. Um, anyway, I, I use this terminology just to make it clearer, right? So let's look at each room in a bit more detail. Room one, children are coming into this room, experimenter brings them in. Um, there's a five-foot bobo doll in the room. There's some toys, Tinker Toys, as you can see there, which the adult model plays with. And there's also some potato prints. I don't know if you can see that picture in the corner. There's potato print and a little table where the children can um, do that activity. So when the experimenter brings the kids in, he gives them this activity, either potato prints or picture stickers. And uh, the reason why is because those are fun activities for kids. They're very engaged and it keeps them occupied in the room, right? The, the experimenter wants the kids to stay in the room and do stuff. Um, and then they bring in the model. And find, after, after they bring in the model, they leave the room. The model starts playing with the Tinker Toys, and after about a minute or so, um, in the aggression condition, they start aggressively attacking the Bobo doll. Now, the child is in the room, and obviously they can see this happening, and they pay attention towards it, because it's all in the same room. Uh, in non-aggression condition, the adult simply plays with the Tinker Toys and does not um, interact with the Bobo doll. And in, obviously, in the control condition, no, no model. Right, um, I should also mention that this picture is taken from a uh, psychology video online. Unfortunately, that video is no longer available. I can't seem to find it. It was from a YouTuber titled CIE A-Level Psychology and excellent videos that he used to upload. Uh, really, really quality stuff. I took a screenshot of that video and I'm using it in my own classes. I wish I could thank the person who uploaded it, but um, that person seems to have removed all their videos, unfortunately. So anyway, let's move on. So room one, as I mentioned, children were told to play with the toys, um, that they were given the potato prints and the picture stickers. Five foot bobo doll in the room with a mallet. Model introduced, could be the male, could be the female, depending on the condition. Aggressive behaviors, uh, hitting the bobo doll with a mallet, saying pow. Uh, Non-aggressive behaviors was to ignore the bobo doll and play with the Tinker Toy set. And also no model at all, right? That's, uh, okay, so while this was happening in the aggression condition, um, the researchers also noted some of the spontaneous verbal expressions that the kids gave. Some of them said things like, oh, that's not the way for a lady to behave when the female model was hitting Bogodol. Some said that man is a strong fighter, right, when the adult male model was hitting Bogodol. So just keep that in mind. We'll revisit this later on. Room two. So uh, after the um, 
experimental room after they had seen the model, the experimenter takes the children out and brings them into a second room nearby. In this room, um, what's different is that they are very attractive toys, like a locomotive, uh, and, uh, fire truck, a spinning top, some very expensive dolls, a cable car, and so on and so forth. Please go and check the journal and memorize at least you know two examples from each of the room what the toys were. Um, so this is called the aggression arousal room. Children are allowed to play with very attractive toys for about two minutes because two minutes was the time that was needed usually for the kids to get involved with the toys. Then after two minutes, the experimenter told them that these toys were the best toys and they did not just let anyone play with them and they decided to reserve them from others. So, you know, I give the kid a nice toy and then after two minutes, you take it away, right? Naturally, the children are probably going to feel a little bit annoyed um, and... Um, well, that's the whole purpose of the room, right? To arouse their aggression by giving them nice toys and then taking it away, right? So why have the aggression arousal? Well, previously we looked at catharsis and how catharsis says watching aggressive behaviors may reduce aggression uh, by the observer. Excuse me, that's a type which should be in the observer, not by the observer. So that follows the catharsis theory, right? That was the thinking that, of the time um, that if the kids had watched an aggressive model, then they wouldn't want to show aggression in the observation room, right? So to prevent that from happening, we uh, the researchers had to artificially arouse their aggression levels, right? So there needs to be some aggressive behavior so that any reduction as well in aggression in the non-aggressive and control condition could be measured, right? So if the catharsis theory was true uh, and the children watched the aggressive models, um, then, you know, they um, would have reduced their own level of aggression and not shown any behavior um, for the DV to be measured. In the same way, for the non-aggressive behavior and control condition, uh, we want to see a reduction in aggression. In order to reduce something, I have to have something in the first place, right? So the aggression arousal is to um, make the children feel aggressive and then test whether or not they're able to reduce that aggression uh, based on the condition of either being uh, watching the non-aggressive model or the control where there was no model. So I think basically just covered this in the previous slide, why arouse the kids' aggression. You can answer in your own words. Room number three, final room. This room has a three-foot gobo doll. Okay, that's interesting. The size is different. Um, and a whole bunch of other toys as well, very nice toys as well. Uh, some of the toys were aggressive, some were neutral. And also, there was the experimenter who stayed in this room, right? So unlike the previous uh, conditions, in the Bandura study, he specifically mentions that the experimenter had to stay in the corner of this room, uh, quietly doing some paperwork um, um, inconspicuously, uh, because what would happen was they noticed that the children refused to stay in the room unless there was an adult with them. Now remember, uh, the adult model can't be with them in this room, so the experimenter stayed in the room, but they stayed in the corner without being obtrusive or conspicuous in any way. So they were just doing their paperwork in the corner, letting the children get on with their behavior. Right. What happened in the observation room? Children thought they were actually off the nursery school ground. So that's an important point, right? They um, brought the children to this room. It was a bit further down the corridor, if I remember correctly. And um, the children themselves thought they were no longer in the nursery school. They thought they were in a new setting completely. Now, the room contained a lot of new toys. Some were aggressive. Some were neutral. Toys were arranged in a fixed location, right? In a fixed location. Excuse me, another typo there. Um, in the room, so every time the child finished playing with them, before the next child comes in, they rearrange the toys. Uh, they were observed from behind a one-way mirror, two observers. Question, why were there two bobo dolls? So in the first room, I said there's a five-foot bobo doll. In the second room, there's a three-foot bobo doll. Why do you think that might be? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Well, the primary reason is simply because um, in the first room, the adult is attacking the bobo doll. And so adult being much taller and bigger needs a bobo doll uh, which is proportionate to their size. And that's why a five foot bobo doll would have been suitable. Whereas the child in the observation condition, now they are going to be aggressive towards the bobo doll. They can't obviously lift up or punch a five foot bobo doll easily because they're three years old to six years old, right? Well, maybe the six year old kid could, but the younger kids obviously would not be able to cope because the bobo doll is too big. Um, if you remember from the social learning theory, the third stage was reproduction, right? In order to reproduce the behavior, the observer needs to be physically capable of doing the behavior. 
right? If the child is being given a five foot bowler, even if they want to be aggressive towards it, they can't really show their aggression because it's just too big. It, it might fall on them and hit them instead, right? So that's why the uh, size difference in the bobo dolls um, is there. Also, why do we rearrange the toys in the room? Another important question. Well, it's a measure of standardization. You want to reduce any chance of confounding or extraneous variables where the perhaps the arrangement of the toys might be influencing the children. So let's just make sure that it's standardized. All children see the toys in the same Con, uh, in the same arrangement, right? So that uh, standardizes something in the procedure. Results, okay, numbers, numbers, numbers. Um, this is a screenshot taken from the textbook, right? Um, looks a little bit daunting, I know, when you look at a whole wall of numbers. Um, so what I usually do is I break it down, right? I cut it up into little pieces uh, to help my students understand better. Let's look first and foremost at imitative aggression, right? So these are the behaviors that the children copied identically to the model's behavior, right? Which group has the highest aggressive behaviors? Okay, if you just quick glance through the numbers, which is the highest number? It is the male subjects in the male model aggressive condition, right? Now, which group has the lowest aggressive behaviors? Quick glance through, which numbers are the smallest? There are actually three, right? Zero, zero, and zero, right? So there are three uh, conditions where the, uh, where the kids did not show any aggressive behaviors at all. And which group are they in? Non-aggressive group, right? So that's quite cool, isn't it? Uh, so now between the aggressive, non-aggressive and control, so aggressive, non-aggressive, control, which group had the highest amount of aggressive behaviors, right? So again, quick glance through, you can see, uh, you know, which, which group, aggressive, non-aggressive, control, which columns have the highest aggressive behaviors? Well, the one with the biggest numbers, right? So obviously the aggression condition in, um, you know, the sorry, rather, let me rephrase the children in the aggression condition watching the aggressive models at a higher mean of aggressive behaviors, right? So, uh, now this is the table that's taken from the study itself. Again, looks rather daunting, so let's cut it up shorter and let's just look at the first one, which is imitative responses, right? Imitative aggression. So, we want to see from this table whether it was significant, right? Significant is whether or not at, 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 at using statistical analysis is that are we confident that at the very least um, we're 95% certain that these results are not due to chance, right? So first question, is there a significant difference in imitative aggression between the experimental conditions, right? So between um, all the conditions overall, do they have a significant difference? And we're looking at this first column under the letter P, so anything less than 0 0.05 is significant. All three of them are less than 0 0.05. So yes, there is a significant difference in the imitative aggression behaviors across all three conditions, right? Now, which two groups are statistically not different from each other? So we're looking at the numbers which are more than 0 0.05, right? That's why I put a, a red circle around the first two, but not the third column. You can see there that the third column, which is non-aggressive versus control, there's a 0 0.09 and an MS, which is not significant at the bottom, right? So these groups are not statistically different from each other, um, which means that their mean values of the children's behavior is similar, right? Whereas in the aggression versus non-aggressive and aggressive versus control, the mean uh, behavior that the children were showing is very different, significantly different from each other, right? And as we saw previously in the table of the mean values, the aggression group has the highest number of aggressive behaviors. Combining that with this table, we can say that the aggressive um, uh, children in the aggressive condition showed significantly more aggressive behaviors in the observation group, right? That's basically what we're saying. Now let's look at the partially imitative aggression. So for mallet aggression, which groups had significant difference? So again, mallet aggression is using the mallet aggressively but not towards the board or towards other objects. So we can see here it's the first column, right? 0 0.026, that is less than 0 0.05. So if we compare between the aggressive and non-aggressive groups, we see a significant difference in their levels of mallet aggression. All right, also another one is the non-aggressive versus control group, also less than 0 0.05. And NS over there says not significant, right? So if we compare between aggressive and control, their behavior was pretty similar. For Sids on Bobo doll, 
uh, which groups had significant differences, right? Again, aggressive versus non-aggressive, less than 0 0.05. Uh, now, this one I highlighted because I believe in the study, it's um, almost significant, right? Uh, sometimes researchers do this, when even though it's more than 0 0.05, it's because it's just 0 0.009, um, it's so small and it's almost significant, so sometimes you will notice studies can say that it is approaching significance or it's almost significant, right? Uh, what does NS mean? Not significant at all, so can't. Um, essentially, when you compare those two groups, if it says NS, it means their scores are almost the same, or rather similar enough that there's no significant difference, right? NS over there. Um, this is again looking at the mallet aggression. So this is the means table. So previously was the significance table. This is just looking at the means. Um, I've just blacked out the top and bottom, so it doesn't look so intimidating. Uh, let's look at non-imitative aggression. Oops, my uh, animation didn't work for this one. Um, so overall, is there a significant difference between groups and then non-imitative aggression? So remember, non-imitative are the novel behaviors that the children are doing, but they did not see the model do themselves, right? So you look at it, um, first and second one, NS for punches, bobo doll, and aggressive gunplay. Um, the only one that's significant is the physical and verbal aggression, right? Um, and if you look at that, which one was the only one with significant difference? It was the aggressive versus non-aggressive. So if you compare those two, there was a significant difference in the uh, children's behavior. Right. Gender differences, okay, which gender showed more physical aggression. So just quickly look at those numbers, which one showed more. Quite clearly you can add it up. In, you don't even have to add it up, you can kind of uh, see that you know the male subjects were definitely showing more aggression physically. Right? Which model gender influenced the boys more? Right? So which one had a bigger number, female or male? Quite clearly the male model had far greater influence. Right? The kids showed far more physical aggression when they saw a male model doing it. So let's now look at the uh, gender for verbal aggression, which gender showed more verbal? Uh, probably guessed it by now. The female subjects, right? The little, little girls, they were showing a lot more verbal aggression than little boys. Boys were a lot more physical aggression. And which model gender influenced the girls more? Quite clearly you can see it was the female model, right? Male model influenced the males, female model influenced the girls, right? Now, which model condition reduced aggressive behaviors, right? So, if you look at the non-aggressive columns, you'll see there's a lot of zeros there. That basically means that the children were not showing aggressive behaviors, right? They reduced their aggression, even though they, they were aroused in the second group, right? Their aggression was aroused. Which model condition and model gender were the most effective at reducing aggressive behaviors, right? So, again, we're looking at the zeros, the zeros, the zeros. All of them fall under the male model column. So the, essentially what it's showing us is that the male model has a very strong influence on reducing the aggressive behaviors across both the boys and the girls, right? Whether it's physical or verbal, right? Uh, how many percentage of the subjects had zero scores and in which condition? So if you read the study, you would have noticed uh, just one, two sentences where it mentions that actually a lot of the subjects, a lot of the kids, had zero scores for their behavior. Why? Because they just did not show any aggressive behavior at all. But it was specifically in two conditions. Now, the percentage is actually 70%. So quite a big, more, definitely more than half, right? 70% of the kids in the non-aggressive and the control condition showed almost no, rather no, aggressive behaviors, right? Now, um, this was the third condition, right? The pictures here are the third condition. Let's look at some of the non-aggressive, um, excuse me, rather the toys that they played with, right? So the journal does uh, record what were the toys that um, girls preferred to play with. Looking at the picture, you can probably guess it was like the tea set, if I remember. Yeah, the tea set, the girls loved playing with the tea set. Uh, what toys did boys prefer to play with? Was the gun, definitely the gun, they played with that more, much more, right? So again, there's, um, you know, the children, even at a young age, are able to um, pick the toys in a sex type, sex type way, right? They're able, they they kind of have this impression that some toys are for girls and some toys are for boys, right? And which toys had no gender differences, so completely neutral when it came to gender, uh, was the farm animals, if I remember correctly, and other toys as well. You can read the study for more examples, but I'm pretty sure the farm animals were gender neutral. Both the boys and, and the girls played with them. Now, which group of children sat quietly and did not interact with the toys very much, right? Which group do you think it was? Aggressive, non-aggressive, or control? 
it was the non-aggressive condition, right? Children who watched a non-aggressive model just sat quietly in the corner and they didn't even interact with the toys very much, right? Which is quite interesting. Now, let's look at some of the qualitative data, right? We've looked at all the numbers. Let's look at some of the verbal responses. As we saw earlier, children made some disapproving or even surprised comments when observing the aggressive female model, especially, right? They said, oh, that's not the way for a lady to behave. Or they even made uh, approving comments when observing the male model instead, right? That man is a strong fighter, right? So even from a young age, these children, they've got this kind of like sex, um, sex type behavior that they're able to identify what is appropriate and what's not appropriate, right, for certain genders. So in conclusion, we see that observed aggressive behaviors are imitated, right? The evidence is clear that the children watched aggressive behaviors and imitated them. Observed non-aggressive behaviors are also imitated. They watched a peaceful model just playing quietly with toys and they also uh, imitated that kind of behavior. Children are also more likely to imitate the same sex model, which we saw earlier from the numbers. Boys tend to imitate the males, females tend to imitate the female, uh, sorry, girls tend to imitate the females. And boys are more likely to imitate aggression, or rather physical aggression, rather than girls, right? Physical aggression more than girls. So there were some discussion points in the study as well, uh, which I'll briefly run through, where Bandura says that social imitated, uh, when you compare social imitation to reinforcement, uh, social imitation is like a shortcut method, right? It's a lot faster. Even after one observation, the children are able to imitate the behavior and that shows that they're learning, right? Um, whereas when it comes to reinforcement, if you remember from the rats pressing the lever, it takes a few rounds of learning before the rats learn that the pressing of the lever gives them the reward, right? So reinforcement, um, Bandura is saying is a bit slower, I think, and social limitation is a lot faster, shortcut. Right? Aggressive model basically lowers our inhibition and increases our aggression reactions, right? So if we're put in a frustrating situation and we see someone perform an aggressive behavior, that most likely will reduce our inhibitions to aggression and increase our aggressive reactions, right? If you think about this, for example, like you're at a football game and your team just lost and you're really angry and you see someone kicking stuff around, um, it, it, you would be um, less inhibited to being aggressive, right? You might start kicking stuff around too. So imitation learning was proven, right? Because subject's aggression was an uh, imitation of model's aggression. The model hit the bobadog with the mallet, the subjects followed, right? So that shows imitation learning was proven in this experiment. Miller and Dollar, uh, Miller and Dollar rather, in 1941, they did an experiment which they felt was imitative learning, but Bandura criticized the experiment and said that no, what they're doing is discrimination learning. Um, I don't know the full details of the experiment, but briefly it was something to do with um, a leader performing a certain behavior and receiving a reward or punishment, if I remember correctly, and then the followers of the subjects had to then uh, choose to repeat the same behavior, right? So Bandura calls this discrimination learning because um, they're just choosing between uh, two choices of behaviors which they're already familiar with, right? Whereas when um, Bandura did his study, it's different, right? He's looking at complex patterns, right? The behaviors that the models, uh, that the models displayed were rather complex, uh, both verbally and uh, physically. And it was, this imitative learning was not done during the exposure, right? It was not done in the room where the model was present, the model was not present in the observation room, and the children still repeated the behavior. Additionally, there are no reinforcers in Bandura study. The children are not rewarded, and there's no vicarious reinforcement either, right? The models are not rewarded in any way. So, uh, in the study as well, the male model was seen to have more significant differences in the aggression condition and non-aggression condition when compared to the female model, right? The male model had a far greater impact on both the boys and the girls, right? Uh, which is interesting. I mean, it's, think about it, you know, um, in society today, uh, male role models are very much lacking, as, as people like to say, uh, we need good, strong male role models as well in society, right? Um, because kids tend to follow uh, good role models, right? There's a lot of impact. And so Rosenblit in 1959, they noticed that male experimenters were also more effective than female experimenters in influencing children's behavior. So they tried to come up with a reason to explain this, and they called it the social deprivation um, of males, right? Especially in educational settings. Um, I can't really think of a specific example other than this general stereotypical feeling that you might have 
uh, I've felt before like in a school where they tend to prefer uh, female teachers more than male teachers. Have you noticed that? Um, I've noticed it um, when it comes to tuition, right? Um, especially on online websites. A lot of the online websites where I'm from in Malaysia, uh, they tend to prefer female tutors, right? They always put female only, female preferred. Um, so it seems like males have a depriva there's a deprivation towards males in society, right? And because of that, males then have a higher reward value. It's kind of a little bit paradoxical in a way, right? So, but you know, it's, think of it this way, right? Children um, kind of like um, have this idea, I guess, that society has uh, uh, deprives males so that when they're put in a situation where they see a male model, suddenly that male, like, wow, I don't get to see this male model very often and um, therefore has higher reward value, perhaps, if, you know, just watching them do something and following their behavior, right? It's kind of like saying that we always like the things that are not good for us, <laughs> in a way, right? Um, highly masculine type behavior, such as physical aggression, uh, both boys and girls are influenced by the male model more, right? So when the behavior is masculine, um, the kids tend to follow after the male model. Uh, what about the behavior that's less masculine or less sex type rather, right? So verbal aggression uh, doesn't really have a sex difference. Uh, both males and females do show verbal aggression. So in those cases, the, the kids are more likely to follow the same sex model, right? Uh, now Bandura has this weakness where he assumed that it was the maleness or the femaleness of the model which was uh, impacting the children. But it could very much have also been the personality of the models, right? The personal characteristics that they might have. Maybe some of the models were friendlier than others, right? So, you know, um, it's hard to say. His study is limited. It doesn't really test for this. Um, so that is one of the limitations in his study. Now, children's comments obviously showed us that they recognize what is sex-appropriate behavior. Even from a very young age, they're able to differentiate. Um, past study shows that this is um, from the influence of their parents, right? The quiet model or the non-aggressive model uh, managed to reduce aggression a lot and also restricts the range of behavior. If you notice and remember, actually the, the kids who watched the non-aggressive model, um, many of them did not even play with the toys. They just sort of like sat quietly in the corner, right? Um, some researchers have tried to explain why do uh, we copy aggressive behaviors. This identification with the aggressor uh, theory by Freud or defensive identifications called by Maurer. Um, I'll briefly explain this with an example. If you have seen the movie or the series on Netflix called uh, Money Heist, um, I remember my students were like, yes, teacher, we've, uh, we've seen Money Heist, and it's so good, and yeah, that's true. So in the Money Heist series, there's a bank robbery, right? This big bank robbery, whereby the bank robbers uh, keep hostages, uh, but when an outside person comes to interview them, the hostages... Uh, they say really positive things, right? That they're well taken care of, that um, they're not being harmed, that all they're, they're being given good food and water and stuff like that. Um, in, in fact, in some episodes, the imposters, uh, sorry, imposters, the, um, the kidnappers actually recruit the um, public hostages and um, get them on their side, right? To do, um, to hold guns and stuff like that and to help them out and stuff like that. So that's kind of like identification with the aggressor. You, you, you know at first that what they're doing is aggression and it's wrong, right? Kidnapping is wrong and violence is wrong. But after spending some time with them, you kind of identify with them almost out of like this need to survive and you kind of like want to empathize with them and understand because you're at conflict, right? What they're doing to me is wrong and then because they're another human being, you empathize with them and you're saying, oh, maybe it's not so wrong after all and you identify with them. That's why you copy their behavior. You become aggressive as well, Right? Um, children of, 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 of excuse me, children of aggressively punitive adults uh, do something called object displacement. So I think this is uh, related to like bullies, right? If um, a bully comes from a family which is very punitive, punitive here means punishing, right? They come, from, uh, they have parents who punish them all the time. Uh, what they do is they take that anger and aggression and they displace it on other objects, right? Uh, weaker kids in school and they bully them, right? Uh, but we were also mentioned in the discussion that. The, Studies that have seen antisocial and hyper aggressive kids come from families uh, which are both punitive and encouraging. So, let me explain. Um, the parents are punitive if the kids show aggression back to the parents themselves, right? So, if your parents tell you to do something and you talk back to them, they punish you for it, right? They punish you very severely. But at the same time, if you show aggression um, outside of the home, right? Let's say you get into a fist fight and your parents start encouraging you and say, yeah, punch him, you know, hit him harder, show me how, how much of a man you really are, right? 
if you're my son, you can really do a good job and show him who's boss, right? So they, they punish the behavior at home because they don't like seeing the aggression behavior shown towards them, but they encourage it when they see it outside of the home, right? So that creates kids who are antisocial and hyper-aggressive. Antisocial here does not mean someone who's introverted and doesn't like socializing. Antisocial actually means uh, kids who, who show negative behaviors, right? Kids who do not show socially desirable behaviors, working together, community effort and all that. They actually um, want to like, sabotage community effort and you know, show bad behaviors towards others. Uh, lastly, imitation, imitative aggression uh, does not depend on the model subject relationship, right? So the models in the experiment and the kids in the experiment are complete strangers. They don't know each other, right? And yet, even then, the kids follow the model quite well, right? Especially in the aggressive condition we saw, it's quite scary, right? So, I mean, this is just advice to people that on one hand, parents need to set good role models at home. Uh, good role modeling examples at home but at the same time even in public right when children are watching us we need to set good good examples as well right because it doesn't matter whether we're strangers or whether we're familiar um, to the kids the kids will follow us let's quickly discuss some strengths and weaknesses so it is a laboratory experiment there are some strengths and weaknesses to this um, type of experiment strengths of course being that there's a lot of control you can reduce extraneous variables so that's good uh, weaknesses would be things like you know it's in an artificial setting. You may not be able to um, generalize the findings. Let's see what else. Validity and reliability. So oftentimes you look at ecological validity. You know, um, how similar was the condition to real life? And can we generalize it to a real life setting? Well, it, it was in a setup room. So, but the room did have toys in it, right? So you can kind of argue either way. Yes, it was a laboratory experiment. The room was set up a specific way. But at the same time, there was toys in the room. And toys, you know, having toys in the room is something that kids do encounter, you know, in real life, right? So there is some mundane realism, I guess. Um, you know, in, di in different cultures, you probably might think, what is a bobo doll? But I, I guess this study was done in America. So, you know, I, I don't think bobo doll is completely foreign to the child, right? I'm pretty sure children have at least played or seen bobo dolls before. Uh, procedures, uh, were they standardized? You know, were they kept consistent throughout the study to increase reliability? Uh, yeah, they pretty much were, right? The... Um, the toys were rearranged in the same manner every single time. The, um, the male and female model had a script to follow. They performed the same behavior for the same amount of time. So the same amount of exposure, right? All the children had the same amount of exposure to those aggressive behaviors, right? So that's good. Increases reliability and replicability. What about demand characteristics, right? Children are naive. They obviously did not know that they were in a study, right? They probably didn't have the capacity to think that far. Um, you know, and uh, I remember see, hearing this example, I think if you put a child in a room with a one-way mirror, they're going to look at the mirror and think, oh, that's a mirror, right? I can see myself. But if you put an adult in a room with a one-way mirror, they probably look and go, oh, what's that mirror? What's behind? Who's watching me, right? Obviously more suspicious. So children, one of the strengths of using children is that they have low demand characteristics. They are unable to figure out the aims of the study. Therefore, they're going to show natural behaviors, which are far more valid. Generalizability, let's talk about the sample here. Um, 72 kids, so... Large sample, you could say it's generalizable. Mixture of boys and girls, so both genders, equally distributed, generalizable. However, on the other hand, you can also say that there were only six kids in each condition. Is that generalizable? Well, it kind of lowers the generalizability because there's only six kids in each condition. At the same time, um, they all came from the same nursery school. So possibly the same educational background, same social economical background, um, therefore may not be representative of the general population, right? Data, both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, quantitative data was all the scores on aggression. You should, I believe, for A-levels, uh, memorize one or two important numbers, um, especially the highest and the lowest, I think. That's good. Um, and it showed basically that, you know, um, you could compare, right, between all the conditions because you're using numerical quantitative data. The strength of it is being able to compare and analyze easily. Um, the weakness, of course, is that um, it does not really show us an in-depth understanding of the phenomenon. Um, right, I can tell you that the boys are more aggressive. I don't know what they're thinking about when they're showing the aggressive behavior. On the other hand, we also have qualitative data, right, which were the verbal responses when watching the males or females, um, approving comments for the males, disapproving comments for the female model, and that qualitative data shows us, you know, it gives us an insight into the mind of the child, helps us understand their behavior in depth, right? But of course, the weakness would that be then um, you can't really compare uh, directly from 
person to person because it's not on a standardized scale, it's not numerical, um, you have to interpret it, so there's um, some researcher bias. Last but not the least, uh, ethical issues, right? So there are a lot of ethical issues. First and foremost, no informed consent, right? And uh, the, the study does not also specify whether or not Bandura and his uh, co-workers got consent from the parents, right? So that's not clear. When a child is below the age of 18, you can get consent from the parents, but in this case, it's not mentioned clearly. Um, the only thing that's mentioned is that the um, in the first page, I believe there's a footnote at the bottom of his study that says he thanked the head teacher of the nursery school, right? But just saying thank you to head teacher does not necess does not prove that he got informed consent, right? So possibly the teacher was aware of the experiment, but you know, we need to have proper informed consent for it to be truly ethical. Uh, another ethical issue is of course that you know they're watching aggressive behaviors and they're then copying it. Um, Bandura made no effort to remove those aggressive behaviors from the kids or teach them to unlearn it, right? Um, so there could be possible uh, long-term effects, right? If they continue keeping that aggression for some time. At the same time, you know, um, having the kids play with very nice toys and then take it away might have caused some psychological distress, right? So that's not protecting the kids well. And um, yeah, so those are all the ethical issues in this experiment. This is just a picture I screenshotted from um, the other YouTube video I saw. Uh, pretty scary, you know, when I see the expressions on these kids' faces, I, I get very disturbed every time I watch this video. I'm like, wow, these kids really are copying the violence, as you can see in the first video, punching the doll, throwing it up in the air, hitting it with the mallet, you know, kicking it, stuff like that. Um, the children copied it exactly. Uh, issues and debates, right? So this is important. Application of psychology to everyday life. So using Bandura's findings, uh, what can you talk about when it comes to application? Well, first and foremost, you know, parents set a good role model, especially at home, right? If children see you behaving aggressively, they're going to copy you. Or, you know, um, when it comes to aggressive TV shows, right? Um, that's why, you know, you have to put that disclaimer, right, in movies, right? Is this movie suitable for all ages, suitable for those age 13 and above? Is it for those age 18 and above? Or stuff like that, right? So you need to put those disclaimers so parents can make informed decisions that, okay, this ch this show is violent, you know, my kids should not watch it because they may copy those behaviours, right? Of course, this, this whole idea of watching um, TV shows or playing violent video games and does it really make violent kids um, is still debated, although most of the evidence does show that the relationship is not that strong as Bandura suggested, or rather um, there are a lot of other factors in play, right? Especially when you're in a community, um, when you have parents at home, the moment you do something that's not right, the parents usually correct you and then you learn that, okay, that's wrong. And as you grow up, you develop empathy, right? And you realize that you know, these are bad, bad behaviors, these are good behaviors, stuff like that. Right? So there are a lot of other factors that, of course, Bandura could not cover in one single study. Um, but we recognize that those are factors in growing up, right? When kids grow up, they recognize what's moral, what's immoral, what's, you know, learn to empathize. Uh, what are the individual versus situational explanations, right? So when I say explanations, we're talking about the behavior that the kids show, right? The aggressive behavior, the non-aggressive behavior, and um, stuff like that. What can we say was, um, uh, supports the individual explanation or the situational one? So when it comes to the individual one, it's, it's quite easy, right? The individual differences that the children showed, especially with regards to the novel um, or non-imitative aggression, right? So they showed behaviors that they had not seen the model perform. For example, using the gun and hitting the bobodol, right? Um, or punching the bobodol with their fist, right? They didn't see the model do that. Or certain words that they had said, um, um, what were some of the words? Cut him or something like that, right? And so horses fighting, biting, right? Those words were not heard by the subject. The model didn't say them. Where did they come from? Those are some of the individual differences that the children had, right? That could have been influencing their behavior. Uh, situational would have been the uh, condition itself, right? The aggression condition. The model hit the bobodol with the mallet. The children hit the bobodol with the mallet, right? So that's the situational explanation for their behavior. They saw it in the situation. They copied it. What about nature versus nurture? Well, it's a little bit here. The, the only point that I can think of when it comes to nature was that boys are more physically aggressive and physical aggression has been linked um, to testosterone, right? So that's the nature part. Boys are born with more testosterone uh, naturally, so they are naturally inclined to be more physically aggressive. Uh, for the nurture part, it's, um, think about it as the, uh, what did the children, uh, you know, when children grow up, what did they learn, right? And some of the things we talked about was the verbal responses that they gave. 
right? Children, even from a young age, learn that some behaviors are uh, suitable for females to perform. Some behaviors are suitable for males to perform, right? That's why they made approving or disapproving comments. We also talk about uh, debating the use of children in psychological research. So on one hand, we need to balance, right? Imagine a weighing scale, then you're balancing the ethics of uh, using children in experiments because they're a vulnerable, vulnerable group, right? And at the same time, the usefulness of using children in experiments. They show natural behaviors. We're able to study human behavior in a more uh, pure form, right? Rather than an adult, an, rather than an adult who could be guessing and showing socially desirable behaviors, a child most likely would show you very natural behaviors, right? So you have to balance, you know, the benefit of psychological research on children as well as the costs and the concerns that we have um, ensuring that we're ethical, right? So you can read more in your textbooks or find stuff online to think about. Uh, that's the end of my lecture, right? I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please like, comment, and subscribe uh, to my channel where I'll be uploading um, different lectures on the A-levels topics and studies. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have any comments on how I can improve, please uh, email, email, email me or just write them in the comment section below. Uh, thank you very much and all the best with your A-level psychology.